Welcome into episode 325 of the Source of Say podcast, your go to Kentucky basketball and recruiting podcast on the Growing KSR Podcast Network. I am your host, Jack Pilgrim of Kentucky Sports Radio. Very unhappy today to be joined by Sean Smith of Go Big Blue Country. If But if I had to have anybody on the show right now, it would absolutely I mean, there be. There are 500 people watching this already. We just went live. I was like, what is this voice and where is it coming from? And then I realized it was Stephen. Yeah, Stephen, you're not m- muted. Quiet. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, like, how are you, Sean? Thank God. Like I didn't know I didn't know who was coming through there, but um, we need the basketball the gods to speak to us right now. I've been better, but I've been mentally preparing myself for for this. I know people wanted it yesterday, but boy, I've been uh trying to process a lot of stuff over the last 48 hours or 24, 24 to 36 hours. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't even know where you begin because I don't think anybody uh, around the program. I don't think any of the players, staff members, administration, fans, I don't think anybody imagined that this was actually the end result. Like, you know, I think even the most pessimistic group of the of this fan base maybe said getting out of the first weekend would be difficult, that maybe they cruise in the first one and then kind of, uh, you know, struggle against the physicality of DJ Burns in the second round, whatever. Like there was just a this kind of mindset of they'll probably take care of business early and then maybe fizzle out if that was the path. The most optimistic side, like me, uh, thought that a Final Four was on the horizon and that should be the expectation going in when there's so much put on March and um, this team clearly having the pieces capable of making a run. We've seen this team put together stretches of absolutely championship-level basketball um, that we've seen even some of the best contenders under John Calipari not be able to hit some of those highs. So we just, especially at the end of the season, when you put together elite play going into March, those teams, historically speaking, end up going on the runs. And that's why you could kind of buy in. That's why you could deal with the UNC Wilmington. You could deal with the three straight home losses at, at Rupp Arena for the first time in the school's history. You could m- m- be be pissed off about it, but just say, okay, all of this was was on March and the end goal and just let's see the vision in the long term. And then when you don't get that and they crap the bed against Oakland, a team that Kentucky had no business losing to, Yes, it was a, an unbelievable in, individual performance. Uh, Oak, Oakland hit shots. Jack Golke doing what, you know, he becomes the next enemy in, in March m- sadness territory for Kentucky. Like all of those things being said, Kentucky just had way too many dudes to lose in that game, um, especially how they lost. And it just so frustrating yet again to go home sad. We talked about leaving the SEC tournament and, and how disappointing that was while also understanding that it didn't hurt them uh, on Selection Sunday and now saying, okay, well, now the path has opened up for you. The matchups are favorable. There is no excuse to not take care of business in the big one. And then they didn't. So, Sean, that's where we are right now. Uh, explain your current thoughts. What what were you thinking as soon as the game ended uh, and just how the last 24-plus hours have been since then? Well, okay. and, and going back a little bit further, I don't remember which day we recorded last week. I know you and Steven did one there in, you know, in Pittsburgh, but my body language wasn't good on the episode going into the tournament, and I think you and Steven both know from the group chat, I didn't have a ton of confidence in where Kentucky was going in the first weekend. And when the game started the other night, I texted our text group and I said, I swear they're going to lose. And it was like in the first four or five minutes. I just could see, I thought guys were tight. Cal called it, played anxious. Right now, none of that matters because we've now reached a point here where I think we're in a situation, in a scenario where four or five months ago, we didn't kind of envision it getting to this point, even though we know that the last three or four years have been bad and below whatever standard Kentucky basketball has for itself, this hasn't been, it hasn't been met. It's not even close to being met. So I think I'm just at a point here where my biggest thing that I keep looking at, it's not as much about what Cal has done for Kentucky because it's what Cal has done for the program and the beginning of the era here for 15 years was incredible. You can never take that away. But we have reached a point here, Jack, where you there's no trust there's no confidence between fans and coach and the divide has been so far apart for the last few years that now it's got even further apart. 
and it was a toxic relationship. But the only thing that was holding it together was a fun team that everybody thought could get it back to being right. When that fell short the other night, I think it's put us at a situation at a crossroads where I think some difficult decisions have to be made. And I just don't know how this program rolls forward with him as the head coach because I don't know how it's going to be accepted. Yeah, and that was, I think, the give and take with all of this going in, knowing that this was the roster that John Calipari handpicked. This is the one that he zigged while everybody else in the college basketball world zagged. You know, everybody went older, more experienced, physicality. Cal says, we're going to beat the hell out of you with with just pure raw skill and athleticism and, and shooting and uh, just all in on scoring, breaking every shooting and scoring record imaginable throughout the regular season. Like, this was kind of Cal pushing all of his chips in on this roster. So there was a trust level with that of, okay, this is a big call. I mean, this is, this is tough. We, but you know, we've seen the transfer led teams that have been more experienced than everybody else fizzle out. So why not go back to what had been working under John Calipari? Why not kind of recreate some of that early magic where he did the same thing back then. We're going to go all in on one and dones and say, we're going to beat you the way I want to beat you, not the way you're supposed to win these basketball games. And it worked at its highs. But the lack of development throughout the season, especially on the defensive end, and the, the times that we just kind of had this thought of, you know, are they actually getting better or – is this, you know, is it is it the opposition? Is it what, you know, a, a lack of shooting on the other end? Is it just, you know, is all of this stuff fool's gold to make you kind of buy into the the vision and just hope? Or was it grasping at straws and, and fool's gold hope? Or was it actual tangible progress? And it ended up being the latter, uh, or the, the former rather. So knowing what we know now and the roster construction what it took to build this team, the highs that it experienced. It, that's why Mitch Barnhart now officially has a decision to make because St. Peter's was kind of the first, okay, 9-16 and 16 was historically low, but there were a lot of ifs, ands, or buts going into that one. The isolation, how the team, you know, not getting certain recruits, having to lean on certain freshmen, Devin ask you guys like that to kind of, anchor that roster just that was never taking off from day one that was your past year then St. Peter's fun team national player of the year you have all of that going into it but Cal had never experienced a, a upset like that in the first round that was the first okay well this is unacceptable but here's your postseason pass we got the regular season pass the year before then we got the postseason pass but it was also like a okay we're officially in kind of warning territory now. And then the year after that, that group never really got going. They had some highs, but they were kind of limping into the finish line. You, you know, Arkansas game was fun, but, it, you know, between injuries and just not ever having that upper level uh, of talent, you never really projected a, a, a serious run. And they ended up fizzling out in the first round or the, the round of 32 first weekend. And then it kind of became a, okay, we're officially in danger zone. This is this is kind of it. And that's when Cal kind of pushed his chips in on, on this season. So I understand there's a, a level of, okay, you know, Cal going to the podium afterward and saying, well, I'm really excited about this group. I, you know, this, this next one coming up, we, we'll see what we can get in terms of returning talent. This, what if, what if, what if, what if. This past year was your what if. This, this was the vision. This was the we're built for March. This was the we're not Kentucky. This team, these, this program hasn't been Kentucky good. I mean, those were his words that unfortunately are now being used against him because the product that he said was going to be there ended up not being the case. So Mitch Barnhart now has a very expensive decision to make it. $33 million buyout. That Those dollars are hard to come up with just on paper. You don't have to get them in a lump sum, but... That's going to play into these things. But as the leader of this athletics department, it's now officially do or die. Let's let's we we may have to make the hard decision right now. 
Uh, and it's my understanding that that's where we are, that, that this is a, it, the, Mitch is in the, you know, in, in the, the, the war room right now, looking to see what the future holds with this Kentucky basketball program. And uh, this thing could very much swing either way is my understanding. Yeah. I mean, this is a pretty important weekend, right? And we, we didn't think like, I think everyone thought we'd be sitting here today talking about whoever Kentucky was going to play in the second round. I, I just don't think that anyone thought that it could happen again to a, a double digit seed in, in the first round of the NCAA tournament. But once I saw it happen two years ago, and then kind of the other things that have kind of slipped within the program, losing at Rupp Arena more than they ever had in the in the back half of, of his time here. Just uh, it seems like everything has shifted. And this is why back just going back a week and I keep going back to the SEC tournament. A lot of people we even come on here and it's like it doesn't matter for seating. And no, it doesn't. But when you look, it's not just the NCAA tournament where this program has slipped. It's all across the board, not in recruiting like in recruiting. It's different. But when it comes down to. Winning in the SEC tournament, they've not been good there. They haven't been good, you know, again against ranked opponents and stuff. They did win some games there this season. They've not won NCAA tournament games. Like, there's a lot of things that were, weren't were happening in the first half of this time here that in the last five, six years, Jackets entirely shifted, and it's just a completely different vibe. And this is a fan base, and this is a program that they, they're not – they're not going to be happy with the results that they're getting, and they shouldn't be. And Tubby Smith, on the back half of his run here, this back half has been worse than that one. And But Tubby didn't do the front half the way Cal did. So I think that that's made it a really interesting and complicated dynamic when it comes to what you're wanting out of this program, because everybody has seen Cal do what Cal did. And I think that a lot of us, myself included, just always kind of gave him the benefit of the doubt that it would be okay. And at some point it would break through credit to him. He's tried to go old and didn't work. Analytically it did. And they had a team on paper two years ago that could have made a run to final four in Ken Palm. Didn't work out going old. Go back to what you're you're doing, which is going against the grain of what everybody else in college basketball is doing right now. It's what he's most comfortable with. It didn't work out. So we've tried everything here. And now we're at a point, Jack, where me personally, I just don't see the instant fix to getting it right. And the what ifs to me now, I just don't have any more to throw in. And I, I just don't know what you could sell the fan base on to to you know buy in on the future, what that looks like. Like this was the you know what we're we got the number one recruiting class in college basketball. There, there's a lot of excitement, a lot of fun. We saw Toronto, we saw them beat you know the professional teams up there, and like they look so cohesive and the, the just the pure raw talent. You knew the flaws, but you were like, man, I just don't remember. Uh, excitement the way that we're experiencing right now. So that was the buy-in. And I explained this on the you know rapid reaction after the loss. The, it has always been uh, like a meat hang piece of meat hanging on the end of the stick for this fan base. It's always been next year. What does that look like? Man, I know this year ended up in, in frustration, but think of what could be coming up. You can't just keep giving that and, and making promises and wishes and hope and not give them anything in return especially when you crap all over them when they say, hey, UNC Wilmington, that sucked, man. Like, we don't typically do that. And you go, Psh, stop it. We, you guys are just rooting for us to lose at this point. No, we're not. We're real fans experiencing real fan emotion. And then you go through the individual losses from there and the streaks and the, hist the, the poor history seeing the vision and saying, yeah, this is exciting, but man, this product right now, while still just continuing to kick the can and kick the can and kick the can and say, March, built for March, built for March, built for March. And then you get to the SEC tournament in March, officially postseason play. And you say, all right, I can leave all of that stuff in the past with an understanding that let's just go see the confetti fall on our heads. Let's go see Reed Shepard hold up an SEC championship trophy. You know that means a lot to him because, you know, his dad was here, mom was here. They know the value of that to this fan base. It'll mean something to him. Let's go get that for him. And then you lose in the first round. Fans go home pissed off, sad, or whatever. Then 
Mar- you know, selection Sunday comes and we see the bracket and you go, all right, Cal was right. It didn't affect seeding. Now all eyes are on March and you got that level of excitement. You went in going, all right, they kind of have pushed aside. It's like, it's like playoff Jimmy Butler in, in with the Miami heat. Like everybody talks about how he just kind of coasts all year long. The heat just kind of have their ups and downs. And then once the bright lights come on in the playoffs, he becomes, you know, a superhero and then ends up going to the finals. Like it's kind of that same mindset where you're like, all right, if we got some dudes that are just ready to, to hoop under the bright lights, let's do it. And then the bright lights came on and you could tell they were a nervous wreck. They were tight. Everything that we said about what we were worried about leaving the SEC tournament ended up coming true. Cal was tight. The whole coaching staff was tight. They were not loose. And it, one way or the other, blame it on whatever. We're past that point. It results in a loss. And now there is no reward. All of this is for nothing. The, the, the biggest reward that this fan base has now is a global jam title last July when the team was at its personnel speaking at its worst. Like this team has nothing to show for it in what, for my money, the most entertaining and fun team. So think of it from Mitch Barnhart's perspective. When again, I think a lot of fans forgot that Mitch went on the record with the Herald leader before the, 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 I think it was the Herald either got a career journal went on record before March madness started with five regular season games to go through the UNC Wilmington, through the home streak loss, all of those things. And he said, when asked about the men's and women's basketball program, said they need to figure out how to make a run in March. One coach was fired. The next one now, even though it's more expensive, I was standing next to Mitch Barnhart in the back of the room when Coach Kyle was talking. And the uneasiness there was very, very clear like you could see it he was shaking his head and just like in disbelief with every single answer and just like not real like not having any idea how we got to this point and that's how a lot of us feel as fans and i think that's going to be the end decision like i think that's that all of those emotions no matter the expense no matter all of that just that raw emotion of wasn't this supposed to be it wasn't this supposed to be the year wasn't this supposed to be the the this is March moment, and now we don't even get a second weekend. We don't even get a second round. I think all of those emotions, when push comes to shove, there's a lot of speculation of, well, does does Mitch have the the you know does does he have the guts to make a really gutsy firing a Hall of Fame coach or whatever? I think all of that stuff will go in. You know, maybe it's not as simple as a as a firing. Maybe it's a mutual parting of ways where he goes to Michigan or he goes takes another job, whatever. But I feel like we're past the point of promises and what what next year looks like and you know dangling the meat on the end of the stick. This was the meat. This the, the fans were supposed to eat eat the, the the get the reward this season and now it's no longer there. Sean, I think that's why w- that will end up being the the end decision if you ask me just from from a fan fan speaking with a microphone in front of my face. That's that's the vibe that I get. Well, and, and the thing with this program, Jack, and, and, and you know this, me and you both grew up in this program. We, we grew up following this program and loving this program, and now we do it for work. And, and we get on here and we talk to what is right now right at 2,000 people live, which is, which is crazy because I wish this were 2,000 people watching the excitement of possibly moving on to a Sweet 16, but we're, we're not getting to discuss that, unfortunately. But the thing that makes this program what it is is the fans. And – If you don't have the fans' overall support, if you have a 10% group of people supporting you, you're not going to make it here. Not in this program. You need this thing to be 90-10 or even a little bit more. And the disconnect has been growing and growing every single year. When it first started a few years ago, you had a small group of people that wanted to make a change. After St. Peter's, maybe a little split. But I think for the last couple of years, it's been more than greater than 50 percent of people that would be OK with uh, with a new head coach at Kentucky. And then you get a lot of people back on board this year because you showed them some type of hope, something that they could believe in. Reed Shepard played a large part in that, I think, just having a Kentucky kid and a, and a legacy guy there, but also the style of play, the way that they were scoring the ball. But none of it matters now because you didn't do what the standard has been set. And this is a standard that's been set before Cal, but he magnified it even more 
when they had bad regular seasons early on, Jack, and he kept saying nothing matters till March. We're built for March. They've not been getting the March results, and that's all that ultimately matters in this program and about you keeping your job. The only outcome that was going to bring this conversation about was what happened Thursday night. If they were playing today and they lost in a close game in the second round, I don't even know if we'd be having this conversation the way we're having it now. Had they won this weekend and got to a Sweet 16, we wouldn't be having it at all. Losing to Oakland is the only reason that we're having this conversation, but it's because of all the numbers there on the right that we're looking at that have now been in a row. That's why we're having this conversation. I don't know what's going to happen, but we're at a point now where we've, I think the inevitable is here. This is a conversation that's been coming for some time, and I called it a slow bleed last week. And eventually, Jack, that bleed just became even stronger. And we're just to a point now where I think we're all kind of realizing where we're at. And it's definitely not where any of us six years ago thought we would be. I still think that the contract at the time in 2019 and keeping him and going all in on him was the right decision because I don't think any of us saw the changes that were coming. The COVID year, them not even getting to play the NCAA tournament. So much has changed within this game since that contract that I I think that a lot of it is hurt Cal. And I don't think he's been able to kind of navigate it the way that a lot of people hoped he would be. I've had, and, and Stephen knows this, I uh, unfortunately spent the entire six-hour car ride yesterday back from Pittsburgh. Obviously, it was sad, very d- d- depressing, and um, but having a lot of in-depth conversations with people of various levels around the program, player, you know, people related to the players, people related to the staff, people related to, you know, boosters, like uh, just varying levels of people, just bas- basketball people that know how the coaching change system works like what it takes to hire and fire somebody how long it takes all of the the inner workings of all of this just just try to get a grasp of all of this and i I explained all of it on on ksr plus we have a a message board thread going on that's uh, going uh, crazy as you would expect in a time of just complete polarization on both sides where it's just all hell breaking loose and chaos. It's kind of being reflected on the message board. So you'll get all of the in-depth details there. Go, go read that, go subscribe to KSR plus for, for those. But Sean, the, the level of even John Calipari's biggest supporters and people that have been there and financially invested in him, the guys that were there from day one and really tried to build this program up alongside him have even gotten to the point where they have told me, I don't know what what is next. I don't know what that looks like for somebody that is putting their real dollars into this program. What is there to invest when they already committed so much to this past like this past team? It took a lot of money. It took a lot of support to build and put together. And they kind of just said, all right, man, here all goes nothing. And those guys, unfortunately, aren't being sold on the dream of another freshman filled recruiting class where you can then use the excuse at the podium after your opening round loss to say that youth is the reason why they lost that game. Like you can't sell the dream. And then when the dream is there and you don't reach it, pull the rug out from under us and say, well, <laughs> youth, damn, it's the damnest thing, isn't it? Like, no, that, that you made that, that decision to zig while everybody else was zagging. And you had overwhelming support in that program about what the future held and all right, man, I'm buying in. Like there was a, a, an all in buy-in with boosters and people around the program that trusted this vision and they feel just as hurt as all of us because they felt like the return on their investment just wasn't what it, what it needs to be. So that's what I'm keeping a very close eye on. The guys that have been there through thick and thin, the ups and downs, and Cal's the most loyal person on the planet about who's in his circle and all that. Those guys are even kind of turning and going, hmm, I'm just not seeing it. I don't know how we do. And if you lose those guys, then you don't have a financial backing. What does, you know, what, how do you pay the next guy, the next group of class? Uh, you know, you, you have money committed to them through these collectives and all that. How do you pay them if the money's not going to come in from those guys because they don't no longer support you? Like 
that's where the tricky things thing comes. I had somebody uh, at the NBA level reach out that knew um, the Kenny Payne situation and how it unfolded it at Louisville and how expensive that hire was and the, how expensive a change would have been. And they said, yes, this buyout is unbelievably expensive. They still have to pay Chris Mack for that firing. There, there are financial ramifications that date back to the Rick Pitino era that they're still not recovering from. But they know that the cost of bringing him back, no matter if it would have saved them a couple million dollars on the surface, the long-term vision is what what they said, look, we just can't, we can't do that. Obviously, Kentucky is not Louisville and their circumstances are different, but our expectations, what they have been recently, Louisville has, we have one more win than Louisville in, in the postseason in the same stretch, like dating back to the, Cal versus Rick Pitino, like all of that stuff. It's they have been the laughing stuff uh, stock of college basketball, and we have one more postseason win since all of that. Like, understand that it's kind of become with our passion and what this the the meaning behind the gold standard of Kentucky basketball all stands for. There has been nothing really to show for it in recent years, and that patience has not just isn't just wearing thin; it has worn thin and is completely gone at this point. It, it will become more expensive long term to keep this keep this moving forward is the 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 read that I get from the people that are making the financial decisions involved with this. And 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 one more note on what happened this year. And I know it, it, at some point, Jack, like I bet we don't even have this conversation about this year's team anymore because this has become a big picture thing and not just a what happened a couple of days ago or what happened the last four or five months, but. I said it on last week's episode that I thought that he was relaxed and comfortable early in the season, that the pressure wasn't there. As the season went along, the pressure started to to climb and it started to weigh on him and you could tell. And then it got to a point, you know, I know that he, he tried to keep them relaxed entering the tournament, you know, they went bowling and, and things, but when you're doing things that you've not been doing, it signals that you're trying to keep something away. You're trying to keep them relaxed. And by doing those things, I think you almost made it seem like, okay, you probably created pressure because now you're making it them feel the weight of it. And and I thought we talked about this a year ago. When me and you got back home from Greensboro after they lost to Kansas State, we said the weight of the world is going to be on this team and none of these kids were responsible for it. And that's what happened. You saw, I saw the look of fear in a lot of guys the other night in their eyes. Antonio Reeves, I'm glad I had a good game. I was glad to see him make shots, take shots, and put Kentucky in a position to survive. It didn't work out. It didn't happen. But when you look back at this thing, college basketball has went through a significant transition period just in the last three years with Transfer Portal, with NIL, one and done, all of it is kind of just coming together in its transition. And there's been so many different things that you're having to navigate. It's a lot of older guys are getting out of this thing now. Dis- discussions that I've had with people in me trying myself to break into college basketball is like, why do you want to break into this? There's people that want to get out of it. And when you've done it for 25 to 30 years, nothing has changed the way it has the last three at any point. But What's happened now, Jack, is the super COVID seniors. That stuff's going to cycle out here. The college basketball is still going to stay old because now there is something to keep those guys around that's called NIL. And it's created a different dynamic that just a couple of years ago, college basketball was super young. And we talked about how it wasn't a good product because so many guys were out the door into the NBA that there wasn't the – four or three or four year guys at the elite top end programs. It's made it harder because it's leveled the playing field for a lot of these programs because they can completely reconstruct their roster in four weeks from the portal. And coaches can take teams in the NCAA tournament with an entirely different roster than they did a year ago. And it's full of veteran guys. Like a lot has happened, but Cal went back to what he was comfortable with Jack. But the thing that hurt to me with this team, when you gave him less to manage, I thought he was excellent. When he had no choice but to manage eight guys and Trey Mitchell playing the five, 
he had no he, there was no decision making to make when it comes to rotation and where he wanted to go. He could play the guys that he wanted to play. Once you gave him three seven footers, and I'm not laying the blame on Kentucky's interior at all. I'm just saying what it did is I, I think that he started managing everything and over managing it, and he never settled in on a set rotation at all. And I think it kept Kentucky so off balance that they just never found their identity of what they wanted to be other than just try to go out and score everybody. They never settled in on anything. It was a different seven-footer that felt like every single night with different lineup combinations. And I just think that some loyalty to some guys ended up being a fatal flaw in some lineups. Like once we got to the end of the year, we clearly knew that Rob Dillingham, yes, Reed Shepard did not have a good game. But when you look at possessions, Kentucky was better offensively when he was on the floor just as an option than when he was when he wasn't on the floor, when you break it down analytically. Reeves, Dillingham, and Reed should have been the direction that this team went and committed to. They didn't play enough together, Jack. And that's a decision that he made. And it was a stubborn one. And it's so ultimately just in the situation we're in. I honestly feel that way. So what is what what would that look like next year too? So even okay, it's my understanding that John Calipari would like to be back, and that it's not a he he wants to give it one one last shot and say, I know that this ending was a failure. Let's see if we can make it right. Let's see what if I what I can do to try to get back in the good graces. So there's at least an openness to change, and that was a, a part of it. In you know talking about it on the message board, I, I think selling the dream to Mitch Barnhart will be top priority for him moving forward. And what that looks like is. You got to get some returns. You got to get some guys from this group that are maybe the fringe guys that we've seen in the past of the Chris Livingstons and the, you know, the guys that should be coming back, but have their own ties and political affiliations in the basketball world to, to leave the DJ Wagners of this group, the, you know, those guys that everything is telling them to leave, but their draft stock is indicating that they need to come back. It would be that vision to, to say, we're going to get back DJ. We're going to do whatever it takes to get back Reed. Let's let's try to to build this super team and recreate the 2014-15 run and say, you know what? That heartbreak sucks. Let's go replace that hole in our respective blue hearts to you know, bring bring in number 9 back. That is the vision. The defensive inability throughout the season and and just never being able to break through or see any type of of progress on that end of the floor. Uh, has become a very real issue. And I think that it would take some staff changes to make that happen on Mitch Barnhart's side, just to, to have some semblance of trust that the, the even the best case scenario of what next year's team looks like wouldn't go to waste because of a lack of, of preparation and a lack of development on that end of the floor. Um, getting, you know, going, Seth Greenberg talked, uh, Greenberg talked about it on, on um, you know, college game day and various outlets since then his biggest supporter and friend in this business saying that Cal has gone away from the grit and the physicality and the, the toughness and those things, finding a vision of that as well, like trying to sell something. It's, it's my understanding that it's one more pitch from on John Cal Perry's side to say, let's run this thing back. Let's see if we can build a team that has no choice, but to make a final four, which was supposed to be this past year, but kind of an all in, whatever will that message resonate with Mitch Barnhart and in his side I don't I don't know and considering we've already known what this recruiting class looks like and we've known that some of these guys should be coming back anyway like I don't think that's something that's going to just be this make or break all right man let's let's just try it for one last shot um Sean the one kind of theory that has come up recently just thinking out loud you know basketball friends the idea of if there is a resolution, if there is a negotiation, if you will, of, okay, if you want this one last year, if you want to run this back with one last year with the promise of staff changes and, you know, creating this super team, if you will, put your money where your mouth is and let's renegotiate your contract. Let's get rid of the lifetime stuff. Let's, you know, make the buyout somewhat 
eatable and, and, and you know or just take it away completely and let's let's see what this looks like and then we can re renegotiate at the end of this if if the end result is what you say it is that is something that i could see the fans getting behind knowing that the foundation is set for a competitive group but with the mindset of you got no choice but to make a run let's do it now the the tricky part of that is now every game becomes the civil war of you better win this one or else the end of the year you're you're out like the the pressure that we felt with every loss this season the unc wilmington the three home losses at, at rough in a row all of that stuff will be multiplied by 10. i don't think that's a going to create anything less than a toxic work environment and fan environment and just sports and environment atmosphere every single game. I, I think that's too much to put on the line for everybody involved. And if this team felt the pressure by the end of the year, if this team felt the weight of the world on their shoulders and the coaching staff felt that way, how would a make or break season knowing that you have no contractual obligation this point forward, you are coaching for your job, your, for your, your, job and your coaching life right now i don't know if that's a healthy relationship and i think all of those things will lead to mitch ultimately saying guys this is just too much this is this is just too much to even try to will into existence like at some point we just got to call call it what it is and say that that this thing is run its course that's that's the feel that i get but coach cow will try there is there is an effort on his side to try to get this thing back to where it needs to be under him in Lexington. Yeah, and and renegotiating a contract requires communication. And I feel like, uh, Jack, that a lot of that stuff has gone away in the last four or five years. I just don't think that there's been a great level of communication or connection with, with Cal and a lot of people in this program and a lot of people around the program, the people that he trusted the most early on. I don't know what those relationships are like today, but I'm sure they're not as great as what they were at one point. And certainly the, the relationship between fans and coach isn't as good as what it was at, at one point in his tenure here. So this is going to be a really interesting 48 hours going into Monday and probably into Tuesday, because if you if you do decide to make a change, if that is ultimately what is decided, and I have no idea what's coming, but we do know that this is the first time, Jack, that I think we can actually say that some type of discussions are going to be had about whether or not this is the right direction for this program to continue going. I believe this is the first real conversations to where it is on the table that they move forward and go a different direction. I don't think at any point that's really truly been considered maybe in someone's mind, but not in a room with some guys sitting around actually making those decisions. But now that we've reached this point, you got to start looking at the possibility of where Kentucky could go with this job and what kind of pressure comes with it. When Cal was hired here in 2009, the game of college basketball was entirely different. But I think then it was actually harder to navigate a coaching change where now with the portal, Jack, if this had, if this had happened, I, I had reached a point when it got the year nine or ten of the Calipari era that I think we'd all accepted that when Cal walked out the door, that the cupboard was going to be bare, and whoever came in was probably going to have to take a couple years to build it to what they wanted to do. Now with the transfer portal, and whatever coach comes, if they have a top recruiting class that can move with them. I think it's put Kentucky and everyone in college basketball in a position to kind of navigate coaching changes better than what they would have a decade or 15 years ago. When Cal got here, the reason Kentucky flipped it is because he brought an elite recruiting class with him. Not many people at that time could have done that, and that's what made it so impressive. But the climate is different now, and you can kind of get both. If you get a guy that's got a good class, comes with him, plus you've got the transfer portal. That's why I think it's important here very soon – to make a decision because the portal's starting to get active, recruiting classes, everything like that. But also like on the side that you were talking about, if there's a renegotiation, then you want to know who's coming back and what it looks like. You, I just don't think that you can go all in on a freshman group that's not as talented as the one they just had. That's a dangerous game to play. Sean, is there a scenario where you get back Reed Shepard, DJ Wagner, Adu Thero, and Big Z? alongside the talent that we have 
coming in right now that you could feel comfortable going into next season with from a personnel perspective and and trusting that vision. Who who all did you say? Adu, Z, Reed Shepard. Adu, Z, Reed Shepard, and DJ Wagner. If you if you can if you can guarantee that those four are a part of your roster, is that something that you could get behind and say, okay, one last ride. He either rides into the, he's going to ride into the sunset one way or the other, or maybe it's such a success that we just you know re-energizes or whatever. However, that ends. Is that something that you could comfortably move into next year? Saying, I mean, that's a backcourt that I think on paper, if you if you gave me a sophomore DJ Wagner and, and a Reed Shepard, who I, I think could be a preseason, you know, all of my, be on one of the preseason All American teams, I think you have two guards that you can at least build around and, and some veteran pieces there with a, a good class coming in. But I, I still think Kentucky would have to do some stuff in the portal too with it, but. I think if I think that's the other thing too with this roster is if people knew that like sixty percent of it could come back, I think it mm-hmm. would be at least a little bit more acceptable. But it would have been easier to swallow if they had won some games in the NCAA tournament. The fact that they lost in the first round again, Jack, I think that you could almost bring this entire team back, and I think that there would be some people that would still say, "No, nah, I've had enough." And I think that we've reached a point here, and I think everybody's exhausted mentally and physically from following this, that if you bring him back, you mentioned it. Losing a game in November is going to feel like losing a game in March. And what happened this year was the pressure got to these kids. The pressure got to this staff. That pressure is not going away. That pressure is not going away until this program goes on a run. I just keep it's coming tough. back to I just keep coming back to that it, at some point the environment becomes so toxic that the only way to for everyone to heal from it is just to move forward and sometimes it takes a separation and I just feel like that we are reaching that point and it's it's very uncomfortable to have to have that conversation because I never thought we'd reach this point which tells me whoever's next the shelf life for a coach at Kentucky cannot go more than 10 years in today's era. Like it's just, yeah, it's, so, it's so demanding on you. Does that change the thought of, of who the replace? So that's the, the other half of all of this and why I do not envy Mitch in this decision. I know on paper, a fresh start makes the most sense for everybody involved. I think Cal could, you know, having new ears to listen to the Calisms and the excitement and build m- support unanimously at a new program, I think could be unbelievable. I think Cal could go somewhere else and find an unbelievable amount of success elsewhere because it's a new, a a new fan base, new ears to listen to that and get excited about and, and, you know, new pots of money and different angles to hit with. Like I could see that part. I could also, also understand the financial issue that is just trying to get rid of him outright right now, how that would impact Mitch Barnhart's coaching search next. There is not a guy right now that you just look at point blank period as there's your guy. Scott Drew is the only guy that I could say with confidence that Mitch Barnhart loved, loves, and kind of fits some of the the identity and culture things that Mitch is looking for in an ex-coach, but he's going to be expensive. And it would also cost a lot of money to get him out of Baylor right now and that's a lot of what ifs for a just that 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 one is very complicated for a number of reasons but you know beyond the the Drew family is very you know private school driven and the the money that goes into that and some of those things like the the entire Drew family I think out of like 68 years that they have been coaches together like 65 of them have been at private school. So like that's something to keep a close eye on in terms of just assuming that he would just drop what he's doing to go to a public publicly funded university. So that one is complicated. I lean no in that one. And then you go to the Jay Wrights of the world. You go to the uh, Billy Donovans and the, the Brad Stevens, all the dream pie in the sky stuff. They all have their respective reasons for no. I talked to somebody that knows Brad Stevens very well and asked about what his interest would be being at Kentucky. And he said, uh, I have Jason Tatum. No, thanks. Like, uh, 
there are for financial reasons for what their current personnel and situation like there there isn't a clear cut that's your guy guy but that also can't just limit Mitch Barnhart to say well there's no clear cut replacement so let's just run it back and just accept whatever this is right now because that also develops complacency on Cal's side and doesn't kind of have a foot to say we have no choice but to make a final four if you are just uh, you know allowed to return it would have to come with with some stipulations so there isn't a clear cut choice but you know as well as anybody Sean that the coaching world is vast that there you don't have to go get a name brand guy just because you are Kentucky if you do a national search and hire the right people to make this decision you can find a guy that can fill you know and, and are we really looking for a PR politician y guy to be the face of this program or do we just say we need a dude that can be the X and O basketball guru? Let's just do get a guy that's going to win the games. Who cares about the the other stuff that comes with being at Kentucky? I th- there could be a guy out there. There just isn't a clear cut one right now, Sean. And and that's the 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 tricky thing about this is if you decide to make this change, I think it's important that you know who your guy is going into it. That option one, two, and three can't tell you no because then you start getting into maybe a list of guys that you've not even really thought about. So I think that you need to sit down and you need to know what direction you would go, whoever A, B, and C is, and you put those fillers out, and maybe once you get something back, then you kind of decide what you want to do, which makes this complicated, which is why I'm glad I'm not in those meetings. And I think there's I think there's going to be a lot of anxiety within this fan base over the next few days whether he returns or he doesn't return because there's we we've reached a point here Jack there we're running out of we're running out of runway with this there's no more moral like you know what i mean like there's no more things that we can just kind of attach to no moral victories at all anymore there's no cuz we did hear look at this class look at it's DJ Wagner it's Rob Dillingham it's Aaron Bradshaw it's this it's Antonio Reeves coming back it's Right before all that happened, we were having discussions about how they had no one on their roster. And then it all came together, and everybody said, ha, oh, why did you stop trusting Cal? And we went all in on this. And you know, me and you have had plenty of discussions. I've had it. I said, I'm saving my thoughts until the season is over because I'm not going to judge it until it's done. And now mm-hmm. that it's done, I'm looking at it, and I'm telling people how I feel about it and what I think needs to happen. And now that we're here, you got to address all situations with this. You got to look at who your options are, who your possibilities are, because you don't want to just, I don't think this isn't a program where you just want to throw someone in there. Like when it got down to it and Billy Gillespie became the head coach of Kentucky, that was a dangerous game. It didn't work out. But then you get John Calipari, who brings his number one ranked recruiting class and John Wall to Marcus Cousins, Eric Bledsoe, and everybody to Kentucky. And you get Patrick Patterson back. None of us saw that coming, and it worked out, and it was an instant fix. Whoever the next guy is, Jack, they have to construct a roster completely differently than what Cal did in 2009. But you got to know who you're going with. You cannot fall to the fifth, sixth, seventh option with this. This program needs something good to happen, whether it be Cal that changes it and something works out. I don't have faith or trust in that. But wherever you go, you got to be concrete in what it is and you got to believe in it. You got to trust it because if you do make this decision and you pay this contract out, you can't be looking two years from now making another change because now money's flying everywhere. And also at the same time, whoever comes in here has to understand the pressure that they're that, that they're entering. And it's got to be somebody that's willing to go through the fire and want that. Cal wore it well for a long time. So they need somebody that can wear the heat of this program. You can't not just throw anybody in this seat. It has to be somebody that's built for it. At one point, John Calipari was built for it. I don't think he is anymore. Yeah. I, and how much of this does, does Mitch take upon himself to say, I gave out the lifetime contract. I am the one that financially hamstrung the future of this program and how much, does he like there's a thought process of well 
you know, the contract just is what it is. But Mitch Barnhart was the one that drew that contract up and signed off on it. How much of that does he look into kind of having some accountability on his side and say, you know what? I know it's going to be expensive, but I made this bed. Now I got to lay in it. I got to, I got to do what's best on the fans behalf and what they are going to rally behind. And that's something I keep, just keep going back to. I know some people kind of say, you know, well, he, he's the one that created this contract. I, you know, he's, he's not going to want to try to get out of it. Like, I almost think that's going to be a counter. Like there's a counter to that of he feels some type of emotional attachment and an, an accountability to it to say, man, I'm the one that caused the the backlash and the light, you know, the lifetime deal. It's going to be too expensive, all that. You know, he I, I wonder just how much he will feel on his side that he he feels that he has to make the big boy decision to, you know, make that change. And, and you know, how much that will impact uh, his his way of thinking. I feel that this this will move somewhat quickly. Coaching changes and, and the process is just very, very long. And there's a lot of moving parts that people just don't really account for. People think that you just wake up one day, you know, Mitch Barnhart will wake up tomorrow and say, Coach Cal's fired. It doesn't work that way because there are so many moving parts involved that it's always going to be a process and there's going to be vetting and there's going to be feelers put out and all that. The feel that I get is that there is going to be a what is your best offer of what you're going to be bringing to the table next season on both sides that that Mitch will kind of say, who is the best we could get? What would that look like financially? What would be the best case scenario for us as a university in this basketball program if John Calipari is not leading it next year? Who could we get? How much would it cost? Would the rebuild, how long would that rebuild look like? Because we would absolutely lose just about everybody on this roster, the recruiting class, all of that. It would be a total hard reset. John Calipari's side. What could I bring to the table next year that makes that decision too difficult for them to overcome? Would it be a certain, you know, go get a recruit? Would it be to bring back X number of guys? Would it be a coaching staff overhaul, a push all in on defense? I've already heard that those things may be in the work as works as is. So both sides putting together their best pitch and then coming together at the drawing board and Mitch will be the one at the end of the day to say, was Cal's pitch enough for me to let up on mine? And I think that's probably the smartest way to do this. I don't think an emotional decision is the right way of handling this. That's part of the reason why I, I you know, didn't write a scathing. It's time to fire Cal. This is no longer acceptable. This product is no longer acceptable. You also have to have a plan in place for what the next several steps look like. I'm just as mad and frustrated and sad and depressed as anybody. Look at the, this. This room is loaded with UK gear because I am I am a UK diehard at heart. I, I said I shed tears before this tournament run started thinking of what it could look like and sharing this beautiful moment with my brand new newborn son. Like I I want this just as bad as anybody, but you also just can't make any rational, emotional decision. And I think that's on John Calipari to come up with that backup plan because there was, you know, I've uh, talking to people involved and people around the program that know how Cal kind of reacted to this. A, he's desperate to kind of get this thing right, but they're kind of moving forward as if, all right, year 16, let's go. Like, let's let's try to just kind of pick up where we left off and work until we're told not to work anymore. But something's got to give. There, you cannot run it back with a group of freshmen. Pick, pick one or two guys out of the portal, the replacement for Antonio Reeves and the replacement for Trey Mitchell, and say, let's run it back. You cannot do that, and it will not happen. There has to be some type of blueprint to say, this is what the future of this program looks like under me, or on Mitch Barnhart said, the future of this program without you. It's going to be a one or the other type of deal. There's not going to be a middle ground there. No, there's, there's not. And, you know, and, and everything that I've said and tweeted the last two or three days is nothing against not liking John Calipari. It's just absolutely the not. environment, the, the environment that we're in right now. Like, I mean, I, I shared on Twitter a month ago notes from a practice when I was a 19 year old coach just breaking into the game that I thought that he was one of the most intriguing and interesting people to, to follow in the sport. I thought the way that he taught the game, the attention to detail, everything about it. But, for the last four or five years, Jack, it's not been up to par with what Kentucky's looking for. 
And if this were anywhere else in college basketball, there would be the same programs, the North Carolinas, the Dukes, the Kansas. It doesn't matter who it is. They'd be having the same conversations and things about do you move forward with or without him. And like I said, the only way we were having this conversation was the result that we got Thursday night. Had they won, we wouldn't be having this conversation at the level that we're having it at. That was the only scenario. St. Peter's shocked us. Oakland didn't. I was stunned the night they lost to St. Peter's. Me and you both, Mm -hmm. I'll never forget that night. I didn't go home stunned Thursday night, and that's what made me wake up Friday morning realizing there was a problem. When I'm no longer shocked about losing to a 14 seed or a 15 seed in the most important game of the season, that's when I know that there's a problem, and when you feel that way, you got to at least discuss the possibility of change. Man, it's tough. I, I never, never wanted to see this day. I mean, I, I, again, talking to people that have been his trusted supporters from day one that would have lived and died by Cal, no matter where things went or how bad things got. Like even those guys have gotten to the point with financial interest involved and said, man, I just don't know if I can do this anymore. And that's, that's kind of a breaking point for me as well, where it's like, man, if like, there's not even a, a bit because that's also trusting that the in-game adjustments and the the day-to-day stuff is going to magically fix itself. Like we're also trusting that the stubbornness and the the ticky tack stuff, all of that stuff is going to magically go away for a 65-year-old man. Like at some point you are who you are and your coaching roots and identity, you either live with them or live without them. And how much do you truly trust the process for a guy where he is in his career and what that would look like? And that's why I just, part of me in an ideal world where all things are perfect, I would want John Calipari back as the head coach at Kentucky. I would, because I love the man. He has given me some of my best memories in basketball and sports in life. It reminds me, Sean, the feeling that I had in it. I I'm feeling it currently. Like as we speak, I still don't even know what the end result of this looks like. As a diehard Patriots fan, they just got rid of Bill Belichick, the guy that gave me six Super Bowl rings and some of the most beautiful sports memories of that, that when we were supposed to go 19 and 0 in 07, I cried. That was the first time I truly had raw physical tears coming out of my eyes over a football game. And we had to have a parting of ways there and have a mutual breakup where Rob Kraft had to get rid of the greatest coach to ever coach football for the betterment of the future. Like imagine how difficult that was like getting rid of Cal would suck in the, uh, the, the, the PR and the, the optics of that, what it would look like to do that. But even the greatest coach in the history of the game and football, it, it felt like a hard reset in, in a, in a fresh start was necessary for them. So I'm, I'm feeling that right now in the mixed emotions of damn, I remember that 28 and three comeback. I remember you know, the, every little individual detail of my childhood and leading up to where my fandom is today. I've felt all of those bittersweet emotions of, I don't know if I'll ever be able to feel that again, but I also know that the trajectory and the future and the, all of that stuff isn't where it needed to be in a, I agreed with the decision to make that very, very, very difficult choice on that end. So now in my other sphere, in my other world, we're experiencing a very similar thing for Kentucky basketball and John Calipari and what that looks like. It would really, really suck to say goodbye to a guy that I have idolized and cherished and I've seen as a legend my entire childhood. My entire basketball and professional life has been dedicated to John Calipari and his program. Saying goodbye to that would be tough, but that also doesn't mean that you just have to live with what the current landscape looks like and accept that for the rest of your life and just say, well, there ain't going to be nobody better, so let's just kind of keep on keeping on. That's not how this works. This is a results-based business, and the results have not been where they needed to be, Sean. No, they they have not. They have not been up to par with with what Kentucky expects and and that's the that's the reason we're going to have some conversations here Jack is when you don't meet expectations and expectations is what makes this program special some programs making the NCAA tournament keeps you, keeps your job 
other programs, if you don't win in the NCAA tournament, you don't keep it. At a place like Kentucky, if you don't go deep in the NCAA tournament over an extended period of time, you are running the risk of losing your job. And that's the beauty of a program like Kentucky. That's why it is the gold standard. That's why it is a blue blood. It's it's earned that level of status over hundreds of years of basketball. Now, the painful thing and the brutal thing about coaching and sports is that if you go back nine years when they're 38 and 0 and they enter the final four against Wisconsin, had does he complete that 40 and 0? If he completes that 40 and 0 season, Jack, I think the man walks, and that's his going out of Kentucky moment. 40 and 0, multiple final fours, multiple national championships, calling his shot and going undefeated. Since that night, a lot of stuff has changed, not just specifically from that night, but from that point on, I think each year the pressure just continued to grow and it continued to get to be more and more and more than not getting back to that weekend again in nine years. That's that's just a brutal thing to think that we've not been even back to that moment and having a chance to win a national championship is a pretty painful thing. But how close he was to what you would call – probably the greatest moment in, in college, definitely the greatest moment in college basketball history to not even get back there. That That's probably a, a brutal thing. And I think that's honestly why he stuck around as long as he has, because I think that that has been eating him alive for nine years and trying to get back to not to go undefeated, but just to get back and win one and get back to a final four. I, I never would have thought that he would be here 15 years and getting to this point is surprising to me. Is there somebody I, I know it's way too early to even have these discussions. And that's part of the reason why it's so hard to like the, you know, people ask about the stay and go decisions with the players and, you know, who's in, who's out what that like, it is way, way, way too complicated. Like I had a good feel going into the NCAA tournament of who was going to stay and who was going to go. And I think Cal had a good feel on that, but the way they lost, who they lost to the, the, chaos and hecticness around the program because of it has completely thrown all that stuff upside down so it's it's impossible to say well we're going to have this 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 and this if if cow were to come back or whatever it's so it just, there's just so much uh, up in the air and uncertainty i know it's a very tough time for you know just generic everyday fans uh to you know want that want the information and all that but because of the how it has made the what very, very difficult. So um, I, well, I don't envy what. Well, I was I was going to say two weeks ago, me and you were sitting here and it was in Kentucky had just beaten Tennessee in, in Knoxville. Two weeks later, Jack, we're sitting here talking about whether or not that John Calipari is the head coach of Kentucky next year. I didn't see this coming. At all. From winning at Rocky Top, the way that they did, to me, tweeting that Kentucky had guards that could take and make shots in March, and that gave you hope and confidence, to a week later losing the way that they did to Texas A&M in the SEC tournament, again, losing in that environment, to a week later their season being done, and now we're at a crossroads to where we're talking about what direction and which direction the program goes. That's a really emotional two weeks. And the fans, I think, have had every right – for the last two days to kind of vent and say what they want to say, how they want to say it. And I'm never going to tell people how to fan at this point. Nope. Because that's a hell of an emotional swing to go from winning in Knoxville to where I don't think anyone two weeks prior to that probably thought that that was possible, maybe other than like a couple of us to then getting your hopes up that this team, okay, I've seen it now. They've gone to Auburn, they've gone to Tennessee. And then just to get the rug just ripped out from under your feet with another disappointing loss and kind of being the laughing stock of college basketball because everybody outside of Kentucky is pointing and going, ha, 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 your program has slipped, your blah, 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 Calipari is a fraud. Like it just keeps going and going. That's a painful thing to experience. And that's the other stuff that Mitch Barnhart and everybody's got to take into account here too. Like there's been a lot of pain the last four or five years. It's, do you want to keep doing it or do you want to try something different? It's a tough decision to be making. I'm glad I'm not the one having to make it. $33 million is three years of John Calipari coaching, give or take a couple million dollars. What has the last three been three years been like for you personally as a fan? Has 
the end result been what you were looking for and the return on investment there been worthwhile? I what what do those three years of Cal moving forward look like? Is is the cost are you, are you paying you're paying it forward three years essentially if you make this move? Do you trust the three year vision there of what it would cost to just make the change now plus the, whatever the replacement would be moving forward? And do you trust where that? So look at it from this perspective. Do you trust where the vision and trajectory of the program is going to be in four years with who it would take to replace Cal and the rebuild and all that? Where do those trajectories align? Do you think in year four, by the time it costs to get rid of the, the, the buyout, plus what it would cost to hire somebody else, I think ESPN estimated it at $50 million. Does that $50 million at the end of year four from right now what does the trajectory is it moving upward or tanking into the ground? That's the question. That's that's the, do you just make the early investment now and say, let's just start fresh and assume that by year four the program is on the up and up back to where it needs to be? Well, that that's what, that's Mitch Barnhart's decision. Last note I'll make here, and let's put it in this frame if he comes back and it ends up being a good run, let's say they go to the Elite Eight. How many years does John Calipari really have left as the head coach at Kentucky? Given his age, been here 15 years, how much is left in the tank? Does he want? Does he see himself being here three more years? Or does he see himself in his mind being here seven more years? Because another decade is another decade. That's a long time. Two to three years, not a very long time. One more year just for a last hurrah. If if this isn't something like if you're wanting to get it right and it's only for a temporary right, and then you got to make another, you got to make another change and go another direction. I would prefer just to go ahead and go another direction and kind of get my foot forward with it. And that's just taking timeline into it. Nothing to do with whether or not Cal can't get it right. I just think that all those decisions have to be made too. This isn't a 52 or 53 year old head coach. This is somebody that's on the back half of his sixties, Jack, and has been doing this for a number of years how much energy is left to do it in today's climate? Like, I think that all those things have to be considered as well as what has the results been the last few years, too. And then what can he sell you on now? I At one point, Cal could sell anything to anyone. Right now, I don't know what he can sell. And that's tough. Well, it's going to be a very interesting couple of days to to put it simply it's my understanding that um there are meetings scheduled uh, in the very near future with everybody involved i mean in terms of upper level like this is not a situation where mitch is just kind of looking at it like yeah let's run it back there's there is there are ongoing discussions about what the future of this program looks like no final decision on whether or not that includes john calipari or not but working toward what growth would look like in, in coming up with that blueprint. Um, it's my understanding that the, the basketball side of things that um, the players are expecting to meet with Cal midweek and have that sit down what the future looks like. You know, they have to keep going on until they can't go on. And what, you know, you, you coach as if you have a job until you don't have a job anymore. So they're going to have that, that meeting at some point in the coming days. I was told midweek to uh, you kind of come up with a, deeper understanding of what they're looking for at the next level, whether or not they're saying my time here is done time for, uh, uh, you know, me to take, take my talents to the NBA, maybe several of them. And I expect several of them to hit the portal, no matter how this unfolds, um, that those conversations are going to be ongoing and who would be open to returning. I think that would lead to the final kind of conversation with Mitch Barnhart of, I got these dudes ready to come back. Let's let's make that happen. So uh, things are going to be moving very, very quickly in the coming days. And suffice to say, it's it's going to be um, hectic around here. There's going to be a lot to talk about, a lot to say, a lot to think, a lot to process that uh, I don't I, – I don't even know what tomorrow – I don't even know what tonight's going to look like in terms of what's going to come out and the information. So this is going to be a day-by-day day thing. We're just got to buckle up and – and enjoy the ride, however that thing goes. And stay tuned because we'll take you through it as we can. Like, because, you know, that's what we said when we recorded, when we went to record today, Jack, was 
what we say now, the information could be entirely different in 24 hours. And then we've got to come back and, and address that. So whatever happens, the way we've done it the last four years together, we're going to ride it through and we'll, we'll see you on the other side of this at some point. So I wish that our most watched episode could be under different circumstances, Jack, because I, I do think this has probably been one of our more difficult ones that we've had to have. But we've had 2,500 people consistently in this chat and in the show, and which tells you how significant this moment is in this program's history. Yep. Uh, it's the, the, I think for my money, the toughest decision in Kentucky basketball history. I do. I, I think it is, there's so much on the line here and what the future looks like and the finance, you know, the finances today weren't what it, what they were before with the guarantees and, you know, get, getting rid of guys in the past is just not as, uh, you know, what was not as hard as it is today. Like, it's just, it's, it's a lot. This is a really tough decision. I do not envy uh, Mitch Barnhart, but you know, it's as I think Matt tweeted earlier today that there is unanimous support internally, what one way or the other, what this is going to lead to and what the final decision is going to be. It's going to be all on Mitch. So um, with that, I, I respect it. But um, before we get out of here real quickly, a message from our friends at My Perfect Franchise. The Source Say podcast is brought to you by Andy Ludicky and MyPerfectFranchise.net. Andy is a franchise consultant as well as franchise owner and helps people find franchises that fit their skill sets, financial requirements, time to commit, and more. His services are 100% free, and he is here to help if you have any questions about business ownership. You can learn more and contact Andy anytime at www.MyPerfectFranchise.net. Uh, and Sean, it sucks because we had a in agreement with um, Amazon Prime Video for March Madness and the entire thing, and there was so much excitement about like watching it with with our friends at at um, at Amazon Prime, and unfortunately, we like don't even get to like a, an actual win with that. So it's just a weird like time to you know get excited about March. I, or, before I do that, are, are you watching these games? How are you kind of navigating the March Madness waters? Because I'm having a really really hard time with that. I've watched the people that I know <laughs> and have relationships with. Like, you know, you all know that I've developed a pretty strong relationship with the guys at Western over the last stretch of play here. And I watched them yesterday, thought they had it. Obviously, Preston Spradlin, uh, another guy that I respected at Moorhead State, watched them the other day. But I'm I'm going to tune in today because as a basketball coach and a basketball guy, I, I love the game. And – March has its moments. Sometimes you're on the, the good side of them. Sometimes you're on the bad side of them. And Kentucky was on the bad side, but it's not going to steal the, the mystique and the magic of, of March Madness entirely away from me because uh, I'm going to sit down and watch it and know that at some point Kentucky's going to get back and we're going to be living in those moments. Hopefully it's uh, sooner rather than later, but for everybody else involved in March Madness, if you need to sneak in those tournament games while at work, Prime Video has you covered. Watch every game live on your phone, on your laptop, or relax and watch at home on Prime Video with a subscription. Prime Video gives uh, you choices to add on channels like Paramount Plus and Max, both featuring incidentally tournament games all in one place. It's March, it's Madness, stream it all on Prime Video. Sean, this has sucked. This really has sucked. It's not a fun time to be uh, a Kentucky fan. I, I don't, um, again, like you said earlier, you fan how you got a fan. If you're feeling like it's time for a reset, do not feel any type of way about that because you deserve to feel that way. But if you you know, understand the financial logistics of that and what it would take to find a replacement and not trusting that there is a guy that is just a home run to, to replace Cal and that maybe the grass isn't always greener crowd. I, I understand how you could come to those, uh, th th those thoughts as well. So I don't, I, I, I know it's a tough time for all Kentucky fans and it's a weird emotion because unfortunately this is unprecedented time. We have not seen what this type of sustained failure looks like in terms of post the postseason. So fan, how you got a fan feel, feel how you got a fan. We will be BBN through and through all the way up until the very, very end woke up just as much BBN today as I did yesterday and the day before. And it's only going to continue no matter uh, what it looks like, who's leading the program, what decisions are made. So uh, we'll, we'll always be here and we appreciate each and every one of you, 
by far going to be the biggest show that we've ever done. So I uh, appreciate you guys. Thank you for your support. Make sure that you are subscribed, not only to KSR Plus, the conversation is going crazy over there right now. You're getting in-depth scoop, scoop and intel that you're not going to get here or anywhere. Make sure you go subscribe there. Subscribe to this page. We're going to obviously have so many different shows and uh, content coming up about what it means, the why, the how, all of that stuff is going to be coming right here on the KSR YouTube page. So subscribe to this. Thank you for listening to us, Sean. Where can fans find your work? You can follow me at GBB Country. Find me on Twitter as well, at Jack Pilgrim KSR. We will, I guess, see you next time. If Steven stops the show. Maybe we'll see you right now. Anytime, Steve. I don't think Steven's in here. Is he not? No, it's just telling me and you. I don't even know how to. I guess we'll just leave the studio. All right, bye. See ya. Now it's just me.